Say is shivering in the Sultan's bed. The Sultan, taken aback by her beauty, curiously questions why he hadn't noticed her before. The reality of being in the Sultan's harem had always loomed over Say, and now, it had finally caught up to her. As her tears flow freely, she can't help but question how her life took such a drastic turn. Rewind 11 years, Say was just a carefree child helping her nomadic parents herd sheep. They were simple people, living off the land, moving with the seasons. But everything changed one fateful day when her father made a decision that marked a turning point in their lives. In a moment of fear, he offered his own daughter to the Sultan, whose forces were passing through their area. The Sultan took one look at Say, barely a teenager, and decided she was to join his harem. So, she did. She found her niche, learning to fly under the radar, showing up only when needed, and blending into the background during grand parties. She held on to the hope that her parents regretted their decision and would come to rescue her, but deep inside, she knew help was unlikely. Fast forward to one particular night 11 years later when Saya's usual routine was disrupted. An early visit to the bath led to an unexpected encounter with the Sultan's guards. They escorted her to the Sultan who, surprisingly, didn't recognize her. A flurry of whispers ensued between him and his guards. The tension in the air was palpable. But then, they left, leaving Say alone, her heart pounding in relief. Fast forward three days which brings us to the present, and Say finds herself in the Sultan's chamber. He tells her he remembers her now, apparently, she was too young for his taste before, but he thinks she's all grown up now. She's not having any of it though, and pushes him away. Not used to being denied, he slaps her and threatens to chop off her hand if she tries anything like that again. It's a horrifying moment, and Say can't help but wonder if she should fight back or just let it happen to stay alive. In the midst of this, she realizes she's still clinging to life, even though she's not sure why. More than anything, she wants to experience the outside world again, something she hasn't seen since she was sent to the harem at age 7. Just as she's lost in these thoughts, a guard storms in with some urgent news, the ninth prince is revolting. The sultan, all flustered, leaves the room immediately. Say is left alone, wondering what's going on. She remembers seeing the ninth prince a few times from afar, always engrossed in books. Seeing the chaos as an opportunity, she decides to make a run for it. She covers herself and escapes from the sultan's chamber. She sees two possibilities, the ninth prince might show mercy to the harem women, or they'd meet their end. Either way, she's determined to step outside once more. She heads towards a hidden exit in the harem garden. It's a secret spot she discovered during one of her late night walks. Normally, there are guards around, but now, it's deserted. As she opens the door, she prays for a safe escape. But just as she's about to step out, she's stopped by knights with swords. They question her identity and relationship with the Sultan. She's only a step away from freedom and decides to take it, even as they yell at her to stop. She figures she might end up like those dead guards soon, but before that, she wants to feel the grass beneath her feet, breathe the fresh air, and see the open sky. As she steps out, she whispers to herself, I did it. It's over. But then, a voice interrupts her, asking what she means by it's over, then gently wraps his cloak around her. You won't believe who it is, it's the ninth prince, Kaner, himself. As he lifts her up, she gazes at him in surprise, addressing him as your highness. Three days on, Say stirs awake as the morning sun gently kisses her face. She squints, attempting to keep the sleep in, but a sharp pain shooting through her hand snaps her fully awake. Ouch! What the, she mutters, staring at her bandaged hands in confusion. She sits up and takes in the plush surroundings a room that screams luxury. She tries to move her legs but finds them heavily bandaged. Her body feels like it's been through a meat grinder, and her memory is just as battered. She remembers her world turning upside down, her secrets exposed, and fear consuming her. The nightmare of the Sultan's hot breath on her neck still gives her shivers. But amidst the horror, the night sky she saw before her life took a tragic turn was breathtakingly beautiful. She had thought, well, not a bad backdrop for my grand exit. And then, Kaner happened. He had scolded her for not staying put in the harem, calling her brave. Reality slapped her hard when she saw heaps of bodies and smelled blood. The scent of the harem on her skin made her gag. Then, as she blacked out, she heard Kaner ordering someone to fetch a doctor. 
Stepping out of the room, Say wanders down the eerily quiet hallway. Even the usually bustling second floor corridor is deserted. It feels like she's walked into a fairy tale from one of her books. The harem is so silent that she wonders if it's ever been this way since its inception. She ponders over the whereabouts of the wardens and harem women, but doesn't really care. Retreating to her gloomy room, she shuts the door with a sigh of relief. This room, she thinks, is the only place that'll swallow her into its darkness without a second thought. She spent countless nights here, praying not to wake up. Curling up in a corner, she whispers, I don't want to wake up. Not anymore. Meanwhile, in the room Say just left, the women assigned to watch over her panically try to explain their absence to Kaner. Apparently, they had stepped out for snacks, thinking Say would be asleep for a while longer. But, surprise, surprise. She woke up the moment they left. Kaner, unimpressed, orders his guard Hassan, who addresses him as Sultan, to locate Say in the harem. Hmm, it seems like there've been an interesting turn of events. Kaner then questions another guard about the whereabouts of the harem head. On being informed that he's just arrived, he demands to know where Saya's old room is. The harem head, caught off guard, stammers, unable to recall anyone named Say. Kaner threatens to chop off his arms to jog his memory, and the man drops to his knees, mumbling that he's heard the name before. He keeps repeating it in his head, trying to remember where he heard it. Then, like a light bulb moment, he recalls seeing Say sneaking snacks in the middle of the night. He tells Kaner that her room is tucked away in the northernmost corner of the palace. Kaner, without missing a beat, orders his guards to march there and give the chop to anyone who left the room unattended. The women start pleading for mercy, but the guards are already on their mission. When they reach the room, Kaner instructs his guards to hang back while he checks on Say. What he finds is a shabby little room that looks like it hasn't seen any action in ages. He can't help but wonder if Say has been living in this dump. He thinks it's a shame that a girl like her has been stuck in a place where the sun doesn't even bother to shine. Just as he's about to tell the guards to search somewhere else, a flash of hair catches his eye. He scoops her up in his arms. A guard offers to carry her, but Kaner hushes him, pointing out that she's sound asleep. He then escorts her back to the plush room. A bit later, Kaner clears the room just as Say stirs awake. Her vision is blurry at first, so she can't make out who's standing before her. When things come into focus, she's shocked to see Kaner standing there. She addresses him as your highness as he tends to her hand, informing her that he's the sultan now. She's confused about why he's kneeling, and he explains it so they can be at eye level. As he finishes up with her bandages, she can't help but wonder why the sultan would bother with a nobody like her. She musters the courage to ask him why he's being so nice. She figures she's got nothing to lose since she considers herself a goner anyway. Kaner reaches out to stroke her face, leaving her stunned. He asks her why she thinks he's acting this way. She recalls how all the women in the harem were infatuated with the ninth prince, and how there were rumors he might overthrow the firstborn to claim the throne. She remembers the first time she saw him in the library, and how she was smitten. She even fantasized about brushing his hair back while he was engrossed in a book. Kaner then proposes a deal, he'll answer her question if she lets him get intimate with her. She figures that as Sultan, he can do whatever he wants, so she agrees. She prepares herself for a long night, wondering what will become of her afterwards. Kaner notices her small smile and asks her why she's grinning. She tells him it's because she's doing what the Sultan desires, and wonders if she'll be able to leave the harem like the other women. Meanwhile, Kaner is curious about what's going on in that little head of hers. To her surprise, he tells her to rest and pulls her into a hug. He confesses that the past three days have been rough for him too. He lies down with her, which leaves her wondering why he isn't getting to it yet. Hours later, Kaner checks on Say, asking if she's feeling okay. When she says no, he offers to feed her. She declines immediately, leading him to ask if she's afraid he'll devour her. She shakes her head and says no again, prompting him to ask if no is the only word in her vocabulary. As she blushes and tries to eat an apple dipped in honey, she can't help but wonder why he's treating her so gently. Kaner, realizing that pulling straight answers out of say might be like getting blood from a stone, decides on a different approach. Tell me about the latest book you've read, he suggests casually. 
So she does, spinning a tale of a merchant who embarks on an epic journey across desert and sea with a hundred employees, only to cross paths with a gang of thieves. As she speaks, Kaner can't help but notice how she seems to transform right before his eyes. It's an unsettling change, but it piques his curiosity. As she reaches for the apple again, slick with honey, Kaner gently takes her hand. Startled, she blurts out, Your Majesty, and he pulls her closer, correcting her with a soft, Call me Kaner. Then, in a move that sends shivers down her spine, he starts licking the honey off her fingers. Her mind screams to pull back, but his gaze holds her captive. His touch is so tender, she's practically paralyzed. When he traces a finger over her lower lip, mentioning the honey there too, she can hardly breathe. Then, without warning, he kisses her. It all feels surreal. It's as if her body isn't her own anymore. But his embrace feels protective, and for a moment, she allows herself to forget the ten years she spent in the palace feeling invisible and worthless. When Kaner finally breaks the kiss, she leans into him, quietly asking if she could leave the harem at dawn like the other women. His reaction is instantaneous, he freezes. She wonders if he'd show her the same mercy he showed the others. He tells her that she's free to do as she pleases. She should be thrilled at the prospect of leaving, but instead, she's filled with a perplexing mix of emotions. Then he drops the bombshell, he'd kill anyone who so much as looks at her. Every step she takes outside will be marked by bloodshed. His words hang heavy in the air as he pulls her into another hug, handing her a plate of food with a smile that's eerily calm. Later that night, Saya's new maid assures her she'll be right outside the door if needed. Say asks her to leave the lights on before complaining about eating too much, the sultan's remarks had distracted her, and being addressed as lady by the maid made her feel like she'd eaten twice the amount. She glances around her lavish new room, marveling at the luxury. It's clear someone's been taking meticulous care of the place. The opulence is a far cry from what she's used to. Feeling unwell, Say retreats to a dark corner of the room. Accustomed to eating only one meal a day, she's developed a habit of stuffing herself whenever food is available. Stupid, she mutters to herself, only to be overheard by Kaner. He asks her who she's calling stupid, and she gasps out your majesty in shock. He reminds her again to call him Kaner, then questions why she's sitting in a corner when there's a bed. But to say, the corner provides a sense of security against loneliness. Her own warmth, when huddled in a corner, feels comforting, almost as if it's someone else's. It's her way of shielding herself from the crushing solitude. Saya's silence is getting to Kaner, but he gets it, she's not ready to talk yet. So, he suggests they take things slow, get to know each other bit by bit. Then, in a teasing tone, he asks if she plans on leaving him all alone for the night. Say, understanding what he means, heads over to the bed, undresses, and lies down. After all, he's the Sultan, right? She figures he has every right to be with her whenever he wants, especially since she's the only woman left in the harem. Her wants and needs don't seem to matter. Kaner's taken aback by her actions. His fist clenches, veins popping. He wonders out loud if this is something the former Sultan taught her. It's heartbreaking to see her close her eyes, waiting for it to be over like it's some kind of punishment. He had planned to wait until she came to him, but seeing her there, all laid bare, his patience wears thin. He sheds his robe and joins her on the bed, promising to control himself. The next morning, Say wakes up alone. An older woman, Enin, is standing by the bed. Enin informs her that the Sultan has ordered her to rest and offers to prepare a bath. Say is surprised and asks who Enin is. The woman explains that she's been assigned to serve Say. She protests, saying she doesn't deserve an assistant, but Enin reminds her that she's the Sultan's only concubine and has spent the night with him. Once Enin leaves, Say reflects on her situation. The Sultan will surely add more women to his harem soon, and she'll likely be forgotten. Just then, Kaner enters the room, leans against the wall, and checks in on her. Say tries to sit up but winces in pain. Kaner rushes over to her, gently stroking her face, expressing concern about her soreness. This unexpected tenderness from the Sultan shocks his guards. Suddenly, Say gets out of bed and kneels before Kaner, begging him to end her life. He asks why he should do that, and she replies that she's just a leftover from the previous Sultan's harem. He shouldn't treat her like this. 
Kane encounters that the former sultan got intimate with her, which angers the guards who believe she should show more respect to the sultan. Everyone knew Kaner had no ambitions for the throne, so they assumed the favored first prince would become sultan. Kaner's mother, the daughter of the chief of the largest desert tribe, the Tuareg, died of postnatal fever. Despite this, Kaner's maternal family remained influential, earning him support from many elders. Deemed unlucky because his birth cost his mother's life, he was raised by the Tuareg after her death. When Kaner swaggered back into the palace a day after his 15th birthday, he turned heads. He was a carbon copy of the former sultan, and his stellar academic and martial arts skills were hard to ignore. But the throne? He seemed indifferent. Despite the poison in his silverware and the assassins in his shadow, he barely batted an eyelid. Everybody was starting to wonder if he'd ever show interest in the throne, but then, bam. He seized it. His half-sister, the frosty princess Arantia, had been raised in the palace since she was a tot. Her first encounter with Kaner was when he returned to the palace. The snag? Irentia's fiancé was a loyalist to the first prince. At 20, Kaner got an invite to Irentia's birthday bash. She used their sibling bond to arrange a private meeting, claiming to be on his side. But boy, did she play him! In a shocking twist, she stabbed him in the gut and unleashed a group of assassins on him. But Kaner fought them off, gave his pursuers the slip, and disappeared for three days. Fast forward five years, and Kaner has the throne on lockdown. He took just three days to wipe out his 27 brothers and lock up his 19 sisters. When asked why he moved so swiftly against the princes, he coolly replied that no one would dare challenge him now that he was firmly in charge. And just like that, Kaner was the last man standing in the royal bloodline. His only companion? A virtually unknown harem girl. Kaner then tells Say she's going to be his queen. She protests, saying she doesn't deserve the title. She's from a humble background, her parents were nomads who offered her to the former sultan out of fear. Kaner gently cups her face and asks if that's why she wants him to let her go. She averts her eyes, murmuring that the palace life isn't for her. Kaner then drops a bombshell, he claims he became sultan because of her. She calls him out for joking, but he insists she must believe him even if no one else does. He says that she is the sultan's flower, leaving her utterly bewildered. With a smirk, he tells her to rest up and roam the palace freely, but with two conditions, she can't leave the palace grounds, and she can only visit the library with Enin. Later, Enin gets Say all dolled up in fancy jewels and perfume. Say, feeling a little overwhelmed, tells Enin, who she's now calling Madame Enin, that it all feels a bit over the top. Enin, chuckling, tells her to drop the formalities. As she styles her hair, she reassures Say that she'll get used to all the glamour soon enough. After all, the Sultan has tasked her with giving Say nothing but the best. Once Enin's done with her hair, Say is stunned by her reflection in the mirror. She barely recognizes herself. The night Kaner brought Say to the palace, he told Enin that she was the woman he'd been after. He said Enin would understand once she saw Say's expressive eyes. Now, looking at Say, Enin admits to herself that she quite likes her too. She assures her that she just needs to ask, and the sultan will shower her with gold and silver. Later, Say, Enin, and another maid explore the palace. It's the middle of the day, and Say can hardly believe she's freely roaming around. It feels so surreal she could cry. They pass a stunning white building Say has never seen before. Enin explains it's the Valide Sultan's palace, but it's currently vacant. Enin offers to show her inside, but Say politely declines, afraid she might somehow tarnish its beauty. They continue their tour, Say playing with birds, dipping her toes in a pond, and reveling in the feel of leaves and breeze against her skin. But their fun is cut short when two guards block their path. As Say starts apologizing, Enin steps in, berating the guards for their lack of respect. She explains to Say that they're near the council chambers where the Sultan meets with nobles and ministers. Say has heard of this place, it's off limits to everyone except the Sultan, male servants, top officials, and nobles. Say then suggests they head back, and Enin offers to fetch her lunch, she declines. The woman warns her that the Sultan won't be pleased if he finds out she skipped a meal. But Say shrugs it off, saying he won't know unless someone tells him. Enin can't help but admire Saya's kindness, wondering how she'll fare in a palace full of schemers. 
She suspects that's why the Sultan put her in charge of Say. Just as they're about to leave, Kaner appears, scooping up Say in his arms. He teases her for coming to see him, and she sheepishly admits she just ended up there. He kisses her neck, whispering that she should have come to him directly. She worries about being seen, but the maids are tactfully looking away. Still, she's embarrassed and bites her lip. Kaner, setting her down, warns her that he'll embrace her whenever he wants, and if she keeps biting her lip like that, she'll have none left. Kaner then starts to head inside, pulling Say along, but she freezes, reminding him women aren't allowed in. Smirking, he swings her over his shoulder and strides in, declaring that the rule doesn't apply to all women. He plops her down on his office desk, asking about her injuries. She assures him they're not serious, walking isn't an issue. He kisses her hand, nuzzling into it. She's surprised as she'd always thought of him as stoic, but he smiles more than she realized. Kaner tells her he can usually read her like a book, but sometimes her expressions stump him. Embarrassed, she insists she's not thinking anything significant. He presses her for an answer, and she confesses she was just realizing how often he smiles. He admits he only smiles around her, which makes her question why he treats her so kindly. He counters with a question of his own, hadn't she considered that she was the first one to show him kindness? His cryptic answers leave her baffled. He then comments on a sweet scent wafting off her. She explains that Enon spritzed her with perfume. He prefers her natural scent and starts undressing her. He asks if she's eaten, and she fumbles over her words, trying to lie. He urges her to be honest with him before they get intimate. He whispers that she'll bear his heir, calling her his sultan's flower. He became sultan just to claim his flower, and if it ever tries to leave him, he'll cut down everything around it, even at the risk of it wilting. Fast forward a month, and Kaner's feeding Say while she lounges against his chest. Her appetite's improved, and she's looking healthier. Kaner teases her about being able to handle him better now, causing her to blush and him to chuckle. He informs her that he'll be away for about a week, shocking her. He explains that they've located his father the former sultan and he's going to finish things once and for all. His father must die for Say to truly belong to him. Say's head drops, her mind spinning with the thought of Kaner ending his father's life. She can't help but wonder what led such a gentle soul to this drastic decision. Kaner catches her pensive look and asks about it. She admits she worries he might end up alone. As she sheds a tear, Kaner reveals he's had the same concern. She then asks if he feels sorry for her, to which he responds that he's just sad at the thought of her being alone. He then queries if she still plans to leave him. He reassures her, saying everything will be alright as long as she stays by his side forever. As he intertwines their fingers, he asks her to wait for him. He also hints there's something important he needs to tell her when he returns. Say can't help but feel special under Kaner's attention, although he never explains why he holds her in such high regard. She suspects the peace won't last, that the harem will soon fill up with other women and he'll move on. But for now, she relishes the warmth of his affection. They cling to each other, with Say asking him to hold her tight when he returns. He grins, stating he'll interpret her words in his own way. He playfully caresses her, joking about missing her for a week and the toll it'll take on her. As they share an intimate moment, he thinks of how fleeting she seems, as ephemeral as a moonbeam. The next morning, Say wakes up to find Enon by her side. Enon informs her that Kaner has already left. Say senses something amiss from Enon's expression and hears a commotion outside. When she inquires, Enon tells her not to worry about it. Before she can probe further, their room is flooded with women, claiming they had no idea the room was occupied. They marvel at Saya's situation and speculate she must be the Sultan's favored woman they'd heard rumors about. They inquire about her family and scoff when they learn she's a commoner. Say watches them, realizing her quiet days in the harem are over sooner than expected. Enin tries to control the situation, warning that the Sultan won't be pleased. But it isn't until an elegant woman named Sejin enters that the women calm down. Sejin apologizes for their behavior and introduces herself as Minister Albert's daughter. She explains that almost 20 women, including her, have joined the harem. She says it's customary for vassals' unmarried daughters to be gifted to the new sultan. 
When Enin objects, stating the Sultan abolished this system, Sijin retorts that it's still in place until officially annulled. The other women agree with her, leaving Sei and Enin at a loss for words. Sijin then reaches out, taking Seiya's hand with a warm smile. She suggests they should have a meal together soon, to know each other better. Sei grins nervously, agreeing to Sijin's proposal. Later, as Sei is trying her hand at the harp with Enin's guidance, she can't help but think about Sijin. She's from a high-class family, elegant and refined, someone who would be perfect for Kaner. The thought of Kaner with someone else stings, and Sei finds herself grappling with jealousy. It's an uncomfortable feeling, making her wonder how other women in the harem cope. Snapping out of her thoughts when Enin calls her name, she apologizes and admits she was lost in thought. Enin reassures her by saying everything will sort itself out once Kaner returns. Next, Sei and Enin head to the library. As Sei schemes over the dusty books, she remembers seeing Kaner there for the first time. It's a peaceful place, rarely visited by others. Suddenly, Enin asks about a secret spot in the library, catching Sei off guard. Enin reveals that Kaner mentioned it, leaving Sei puzzled. That spot is her little secret, how did Kaner know? Enin explains that Kaner had asked her to keep it under wraps, but she thought a little hint wouldn't hurt. She continues, saying that five years ago, when Kaner was still a prince, he got severely injured and Sei helped him hide in the library. This revelation takes Sei by surprise, she did help someone back then, but she had no idea it was Kaner. Her secret spot is a hidden compartment on a secluded bookshelf in the library. It's been her sanctuary when times were tough. Five years ago, late one night, she heard a noise in the library. When she peeked out, she saw a bleeding Kaner. Fearing detection, she hurried back into her hiding spot, but not without bumping her head and alerting Kaner. He demanded to know who was there, and Sei revealed herself. Kaner was taken aback by her delicate appearance, even wondering if he died and she was a fairy. She offered to get help, but Kaner insisted on hiding. Hearing voices outside, she quickly moved the books covering her secret spot and ushered him inside. As his pursuers drew closer, Kaner crawled into the compartment. Before covering him up completely, she asked for a blanket from inside to clean up the blood trail. Once she finished, she hit the blanket and sealed the compartment. Kaner couldn't shake the feeling of betrayal. He just found out his own sister was the one who stabbed him, and he was having a hard time processing it. He remembered how he'd showered her with love when they were reunited after 15 years, thinking she needed his protection. But now, he wondered if he should have just ended things then and there. Suddenly, his pursuers stumbled upon Sei outside his hiding spot in the library. She quickly claimed she was one of the Sultan's concubines, which made them question why she was hanging around in the library. She coolly explained that the library was close to the harem, so the concubines often used it. The men seemed to buy her story and began discussing among themselves, believing Kaner wasn't in the library since there were no other exits. Meanwhile, Kaner was inside, gripping his sword, ready to come out fighting if they found him. One of the men asked Say if she'd seen anyone suspicious. She lied, saying she'd been engrossed in her books and hadn't noticed anyone. Kaner was shocked. Here was a stranger, with no weapon or reason to help him, risking her life for him, while his own flesh and blood had tried to kill him. His pursuers gave the library another once over, and when they didn't find him, they told Sei to yell if she saw anything suspicious, before leaving to search the back garden. After they left, Sei checked in on Kaner and promised to get a clean cloth to bandage his wound once it got dark. Intrigued, Kaner asked where she'd learned first aid. She revealed she'd read it in a book, which made him smirk. He joked about her sneaking out at night, but she assured him she'd be fine since no one really acknowledged her as a concubine. As she removed the books to let him out, he started to drift off. She quickly woke him, explaining she'd read that keeping an injured person talking could prevent them from fainting due to blood loss. Say was worried Kaner had lost too much blood already, and decided to get the clean cloth under the cover of darkness. An hour later, Say was desperately trying to stop Kaner's bleeding, her tears falling freely. He tried to comfort her, telling her not to cry. She grabbed a bottle of alcohol she'd swiped from the harem and doused his wound, causing him to yell out in pain. She explained it was to disinfect the wound, but he teased her for being more flustered than he was. 
He took a swig of the alcohol, much to say as protest, claiming it would help with the pain. When she said nothing about alcohol had been in her book, he laughed, saying he couldn't even make a joke without feeling better. Say then offered him some soaked bread, making it easier for him to chew. She told him he needed to eat to regain his strength, her eyes welling up with tears again. He asked her what she'd do if he turned out to be a bad guy, and wondered if anyone had ever shown him such kindness without expecting anything in return. She told him that a real baddie wouldn't ask that question. Stuffing his mouth with bread, he found himself eating leftovers for the first time. He had a weird vision of her growing up to be some stunning harem woman, but he didn't like that thought much. He told her she was an oddball, asking why she didn't scream for help. Wasn't she scared of him? She just said he looked more in pain than scary. Her fingers brushed his lips as she fed him, turning her cheeks pink. He asked her name, and when she told him, he wanted to know if she didn't have a last name. She confessed she wasn't from nobility, she wondered if he was and if he'd looked down on her. People of high status often treated commoners poorly. But Kaner just held her hand, took the bread and told her he didn't care about her background. She was relieved, and he found himself wanting to see her smile more. He also realized that she was like a precious flower for the Sultan, and he could never outshine the Sultan. She got up to fetch fresh water, but he didn't want her to leave. So, he faked a chest pain, something he'd never done before. Say rushed back, and he told her to stay. He was content in life, never really aiming for his brother's throne. He planned to return to Tuareg once his brother became Sultan. He patted Saya's head, wondering how long it would take for her to catch the Sultan's attention. He advised her to lay low until he could come for her. He knew she would grow into a beauty and inevitably attract the Sultan. He also knew that as Sultan, he'd inherit his predecessor's concubines. He began to wonder how long it would take to organize a rebellion, even contemplating what he would do to his sister, who had stabbed him. Next morning, Say woke up alone. She regretted not asking his name, hoping he was okay. Fast forward to now, Say is in tears. She can't believe that the guy she saved five years ago was Kaner. Around the time she helped him, he started visiting the library more, but she never connected the dots. Enin tells her Kaner was hurt that she didn't remember him. But Say insists she didn't forget, she just didn't recognize him as the prince, all covered in blood, sounding so weak and hurt. She worried about his safety but couldn't ask anyone for fear of his pursuers. Say admits to Enin that she often feared she'd never see Kaner again but always wished him well. She asks why Kaner didn't just tell her who he was. Enin believes Kaner wanted Say to remember on her own, especially since he fell for her at first sight. He also tells Say about the betrayal Kaner faced from his own sister. This new revelation shocks Say. Enin explains how Kaner had to fight and spill blood, not out of cruelty, but necessity, to claim the throne. This news makes Say even more emotional. Enin comforts her, saying Kaner would hate to see her so upset. He tells her Kaner would have whisked her away if she were a maid, but her status as a concubine complicated things. Say expresses her longing to see Kaner. Enin suggests she wait for him in the palace and plan how to tell him she remembers their past. But Say is restless, worried Kaner might get hurt again. Enin reassures her, saying Kaner won't let his guard down like before. They're unaware someone is eavesdropping on their conversation. The next day, Say joins Sejin for a meal. Sejin hopes Say will visit more often instead of spending all her time alone. Enin questions this, noting Say isn't officially part of the harem. Another woman intervenes, reminding Enin that Sejin was once engaged to Kaner. This sparks an argument, silenced when Sejin bangs her hand on the table. Sejin insists her engagement to Kaner is history and invites Say to eat. She advises Say not to worry about the engagement talk since it was merely a family arrangement. During lunch, the other women gossip about Saya's commoner background. Sejin steps in, serving Say food and asking the others to treat Say as they would treat her. The conversation then shifts to their recent silk purchases. Say feels a bit overlooked by the others, but honestly she's okay with it. She's about to take a bite of her food when Sejin drops a bombshell, Kaner's been hurt. Say is so startled, she drops her fork. In comes Enin, asking if everything's alright. Say covers up her shock by saying her fork just slipped. 
She's thinking though, Enin probably didn't tell her about Kaner because she didn't want to worry her. When Enin leaves, Seijin spills more details, apparently there's a rumor that Kaner was attacked, but he's not seriously hurt. Seijin plans to sneak out tonight to check on him, and she wants Sei to come along. When Sei asks how they'll do it, Seijin just grins and tells her it's their little secret. Later, back in her room, Sei confronts Enin about Kaner's injury. Enin's surprised Sei knows, but reassures her it's nothing life-threatening. She explains Kaner hasn't returned to the palace yet because he's still busy. As she wipes away Seiya's tears, she reminds her that Kaner's a tough cookie, he's not going to go down easily. Just as Enin's about to ask who spilled the beans about Kaner, a maid interrupts, asking Enin to come quickly due to some issue between two of the women. Left alone, Sei reflects on Seijin's earlier offer to visit Kaner. Seijin promised she'd arrange for a maid to bring clothes and a veil for Sei to disguise herself, and even make sure the guards are distracted. That night, Sei sneaks out to meet Seijin at the designated spot. Seijin instructs her to pretend she's a maid if anyone asks, and then shows Sei the horses she's arranged for their journey. Noticing Sei has never ridden before, Seijin promises to teach her the basics. They set off, and despite being a novice rider, Sei is determined to keep up. As they ride, Sei reflects on her feelings for Kaner. She wants to tell him that his rise to Sultan was because of her, and how he saved her from a world that had abandoned her. When they arrive at a dilapidated building, Sei can hardly believe this is where Kaner's been staying. Just as Sei is about to ask Seijin something, Seijin pushes her inside, urging her to hurry. But as Sei turns back, she notices a weird look on Seijin's face. Suddenly, Seijin lashes out, accusing Sei of ruining her life and future. She even goes as far as saying Sei should have died, claiming that Kaner is hers. In her rage, Seijin steps on Sei, reducing her to nothing more than dirt on the floor. Apparently, Seijin was Kaner's fiancé and five years ago when Kaner came back wounded, Seijin could tell he'd changed. He'd ended their engagement without giving a reason, and now she knew it was because of Sei, who she saw as nothing more than a pathetic girl. She wondered if Kaner really thought he could be Sultan without her family's support. In her mind, she'd chosen the best man and she should be the one by his side when he took the throne. This is why she can't forgive Sei. She grabs Sei's hair, accusing her of going after both Kaner and his father. She calls her a phony who pretends to be innocent but behaves otherwise. Then, she shoves Sei to the ground, insinuating that Sei should be serving Kaner instead of wasting time. Suddenly, the former sultan appears with two guards. Seijin greets him respectfully, while he eyes Sei, referring to her as the woman Kaner has been clinging to. He offers Seijin the title of sultana once he reclaims his throne. While Seijin outwardly accepts, inwardly she is repulsed. Seijin plans to kill the former sultan after Sei's death and make it look like he's the culprit. She believes Kaner would come back to her once he cooled off after avenging Sei's death. The former sultan then taunts Sei about Kaner's affection for her and his plans to use her as bait. He grabs her neck, threatening to display their bodies on the castle walls. But Sei won't let him endanger Kaner. Despite her fear, she questions his character and compares him unfavorably to Kaner. The former sultan tightens his grip around Sei's neck, sneering as he compares himself to Kaner. What makes him better than me, he spits out. He paints Kaner as a wild beast who dared to cross his own father, mercilessly killing his brothers and even his own sister. He's mid-rant about all the ways he'll make Kaner pay when black. An arrow hits him. It doesn't finish him off, but it sure shuts him up. He demands to know how Kaner discovered their location. Kaner's response is simple and poignant, Say is my treasure. I'd never leave her in danger. He commands his father to let Sei go. Reluctantly, the former sultan releases Sei and steps back. The look in Kaner's eyes isn't that of a son gazing at his father. Instead, it's the look of a man eyeing a predator threatening his woman. Seijin, completely puzzled, wonders out loud how Kaner found them. She throws herself at Kaner, trying to spin a tale about the former sultan attempting to assault her. But Kaner isn't buying it. He shoves her aside, fixing her with a frosty glare that leaves her stunned. Turning his attention back to Sei, Kaner strides towards her. She quickly asks if he's hurt, but he insists he should be asking her that. Seijin, desperate for attention, clings to his leg, begging him to listen. 
Kaner then drops a chilling ultimatum if she's lucky, her father will choose her over her family. If not, well, he tells her to pray for them. As Kaner moves closer to Say, the former sultan panics, grabbing her and threatening to kill her if Kaner comes any closer. He orders his guards to seize Kaner. In response, Kaner calmly tells Say to close her eyes. She does, and in the next moment, Kaner's sword is out, swiftly taking down the guards rushing towards him. He presses the sword's tip against the former sultan's neck, drawing a small trickle of blood. The former sultan releases Say, who's now unconscious. Kaner catches her in his arms. He then throws down a challenge to the remaining guards, he'll spare the one who dares to stab their own master with the sword he tosses before them. Walking away from the scene with Say cradled in his arms, Kaner hears the former sultan's parting words, accusing him of immorality. He glances back and retorts, the moment you let your children kill each other, you forfeited any right to lecture about morality. He strides away, leaving the guards to deal with their fallen master. Later, Kaner watches over a still unconscious Say. A twinge of guilt surges through him. He should have kept a closer eye on her at the marketplace. He shouldn't have given them the chance to snatch her away. His thoughts drift back to her, everything he's done, all the battles he's fought, they were all for her. If he loses her now, it would be like losing the very reason he's come so far. When Say stirs awake, her gaze falls on Kaner. His face looks strained, as though he's carrying the weight of the world. She reaches up, cradling his face in her hands, whispering how worried she was when she heard about his injury. Kaner queries if that was why she ventured out into the chaos, to which she confesses that there's so much she hasn't yet told him. Her mind is filled with him, and the thought of him being hurt is unbearable. She has so many things she wants to share with him. Kaner teases her about wanting to leave the palace so desperately, yet choosing to find him instead of escaping. Her laughter rings out, and she admits that even though she was outside, her world was still consumed by him. As he pulls her into a comforting embrace, Kaner admits that his recklessness is the reason for her pain. In his haste to settle matters, he nearly lost her. Say then reveals that she remembers him as the person she saved five years ago, a memory he too cherishes. He recalls her saving him on the day he was abandoned by his family. Their conversation ends with a tender kiss, and Kaner confesses that he's been in love with her since she was 13. He spent every day in the library just to watch her grow into the beautiful woman she has become. Say grips his face, admitting that even though she didn't recognize him, he's always been there for her. She kisses him, expressing her deep feelings for him. In Kaner's arms, she feels a sense of security and can't imagine a world without him anymore. Kaner declares Say will be his queen, to which she jokingly replies about sultans having lots of children. Kaner chuckles and agrees, promising her a big family. Their intimate moment is followed by days of tranquility until one day, a couple sneaks into the library, discussing the unusual state of the harem. They speculate about how long it'll be before it fills up again. Their secret rendezvous is cut short when they're startled by a book falling from a shelf, signaling they aren't alone. Kaner, lounging in the library with Say, asks if the couple's words bothered her. She teases him about possibly leaving her one day, to which he grins, calling it impossible. As they sit side by side, reading an adventure book together, Say realizes her dream adventures are no longer lonely. They all feature Kaner, her one constant in this ever-changing world. Ah, with this, the beautiful love story of Say and Kaner comes to a beautiful end. Did you enjoy this? Please let us know in the comments below. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao.